I know, but Donald. Okay. Donald, are you going to look after it? And I'd like to invite those who will be speaking to unmute themselves uh, at the lecture, various lecterns. Okay, are we ready for our prelude? Yes, sir, the recording has been set and people have been muted. Why isn't she spotlighted? Click on Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, I need to turn the gain down here locally, um, but uh, good to see everybody. And uh, we have quite a crowd online today, as well as people who are gathered in the Trinity Sanctuary and the Mount Royal Sanctuary and here in the hall of, uh, of the uh, St. James Anglican Church where we camp out um, for the time being. It's good to see everybody. Um, not a lot of announcements other than this morning, our service, expect things to be a little bit different because they are a little bit different. 
Uh, Jessica calls this uh, uh, readings and carols, uh, but it's not readings and carols for Christmas, but uh, it is a different format. So I hope you um, find meaning in today's service. And uh, a couple of very quickly announcements, because I know time is short. Uh, this, uh, this coming Sunday, um, I'm on holiday, and so Hudson Folk, you'll be on Zoom only. Uh, and uh, that's all. Um, at this point, Peter, people are asking about arrangements for Peter Monday, and there are no arrangements yet. Uh, the family will be in touch with me at some point for that. So don't have any uh, news there. Any other announcements I'm missing? Nope. Okay. Over to Jessica in Mount Royal. Bienvenue à tous et toutes, welcome. Um, the pink insert is where you will find all in, uh, information related specifically to Mount Royal United Church. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the kids' afternoon out next Sunday, pizza, PJs, and movies, and to the young adult hangout on August 22 because we've got some cheap seats at the movies. So drawing your attention to that. And then when Rosemary does her announcements, please, anyone who's interested in taking part in the Pride Parade, well, uh, make sure you're, you're paying attention to that. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the Trinity Anjou Pastoral Charge, I would like to welcome you to Trinity United Church. We have, it doesn't look like we have a lot of people in person. We may have more people online than in person, but when two or three are gathered together, God is among us. Following the service this morning, those of us in person can enjoy a cold drink in the narthex. And this afternoon, Trinity has a spot in the Pride Parade. If you have RSVP'd to walk, you will meet Sabs downtown on René Levesque between Bishop and Mountain between noon and 12.30. If you're going to watch the parade, you'll want to stake out a spot further east between Metcalf and Alexander de Sèvres, and the parade starts at 1. Our announcements for this week. Monday, August 14th, that's tomorrow, is the deadline for submissions for the next edition of Trinity Talks, which is scheduled to publish in early September. Give Sherry a dingle to share content. The previously scheduled finance committee meeting has been canceled. On Thursday, August 17th, Friends Food and Fun will be planning their fun activities for September, starting at 11.30, and then playing beanbag toss. Lunch will be pizza. We've convinced the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to share their pizza with us. If the weather cooperates, we'll have lunch and games outdoors. For our friends in Zoom land, the planning session will be hybrid on the Trinity Zoom link, but the rest of the meeting will be in person only. In the afternoon, those who want to sign up for next week's FFF activity, which is the collective kitchen at the Epicerie Solidaire de Rosemont, you can come with me to the Epicerie and register in person. Thursday will be the last day to register. You can see me for details and the menu. At 7.30 p.m. will be the living room on the Trinity Zoom link. On Saturday, August 19th at 11 a.m., we have prayer group also on the Trinity Zoom link. And that brings us to Sunday, August the 20th. Reed will still be away. I have not heard yet who will be filling in for him. But someone will, trust me. Um, Julia, had you wanted to share an announcement? Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to say we don't have a lot of people in, in our presence this morning in the building. I'm sure all of you out there are going to enjoy our combined services. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Lola and Marie. I asked them at the last minute if they would lead in the singing. So we just went over it a couple of times just before. So thank you very much, Lola and Marie. And, uh, have a good service, everyone. Thank you, Julia. I'm looking forward to hearing that throughout the service. As we come together to worship today, we acknowledge the stewards of our land with these words. We gather on lands which hold a long and rich history of occupation and stewardship 
by First Nations peoples for millennia through to the present day. First Nations peoples, such as those from the Haudenosaunee Nation and the Anishinaabe Nation, have deep, strong historical ties to this land. Montreal, known as Diodage to the Haudenosaunee, and as Moniang to the Anishinaabe, has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst various First Nations groups. We acknowledge and thank the diverse peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. Our first hymn is, and on this path, More Voices, number eight, and we have the pleasure of Julia, Murray, and Lala. Thank you. Let us pray. Give thanks and call on God's name. Make known to the nations what God has done. Sing, oh sing the songs of praise. Tell of all God's wonderful deeds. When a famine came upon the land and cut off the supply of bread, God sent one ahead of them, Joseph, whom they had sold as a slave. The one who sat in prison became head of Pharaoh's house, ruler of his possessions, correcting and teaching his counselor's wisdom. Such is the vision of God. The first shall become last, and the last become first. But the path is rarely easy. It requires wisdom, compassion, a heart too big not to forgive. Let us worship the one with the biggest heart of all, the God made known in Christ. Quelle naissance, dont la puissance compatissante transforme le péché en santé et la poussière temporelle en gloire éternelle. Accorde-nous une foi gracieuse, afin que, comme Joseph, lorsqu'il fut vendu en esclavage, nous puissions faire face à nos épreuves avec confiance et devenir une bénédiction pour amis et ennemis au nom de Jésus. Amen. Prions. Notre Père, qui est aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne, 
que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain de ce jour. Pardonne-nous nos offenses, comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous soumets pas à la tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal, car c'est à toi qu'appartiennent le règne, la puissance et la gloire, au siècle des siècles. Amen. As our story begins today, as our story begins today, Joseph is a 17-year-old. Joseph's part of the world is hot and dry. His family's way of living is to care for animals and to grow crops. They make most of their own clothing and their own food in this way trading for things that they don't have. Joseph has a very complicated family tree. His father had two names, Jacob and Israel. Jacob is the name that Isaac and Rebekah, his parents, gave him. Israel is the special name that God has given him. Jacob has a large family with more than a dozen children. He's a very wealthy farmer. And in that culture, wealthy men often have more than one wife. It's important to have a large number of children to take care of the land. Now, Joseph has three stepmothers, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah. His mother, Rachel, died during childbirth when his little brother, Benjamin, was being born. Now that Rachel is no longer alive, Joseph's brother are jealous of Joseph because it's obvious that his dad, Jacob, loves him more than the rest of them. Joseph and Benjamin remind Jacob of how much he misses his favorite wife, Rachel. Benjamin was Rachel's last gift to the world, and Joseph still reminds Jacob of Joseph's mother as well. Jacob's other three wives are a part to the family because of economic necessity. But Jacob had married Rachel for love. Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah all have the same father, Laban. But Rachel and Leah are full sisters, the daughters of Laban's first wife. Bilhah and Zilpah are their half-sisters and also their slaves. Since Jacob's mother, Rebekah, is Laban's sister, Laban is Jacob's uncle as well as his father-in-law. You got all that straight? So Jacob's four wives are also his cousins. They sure are complicated in that family. Now, Jacob believes in and prays to the same God as his parents, Rebecca and Isaac, and his grandparents, Sarah and Abraham. But Joseph's mothers have grown up with different religious customs. It isn't always easy to figure out how to live together in the best way. Now, Jacob did not even try to hide the fact that he loves Joseph and Benjamin more than all his other children. One day, Jacob made a beautiful cloak for Jacob, for Joseph. Jacob makes a beautiful cloak for Joseph. His brothers are so jealous. They never got anything like that. And then Joseph starts having mystical dreams. In Joseph's dreams, everyone in his family has to bow down to him and treat him like a king. For some reason, 
For some reason, he tells his family about his dreams. None of them enjoy hearing his dreams about him being more powerful and more honored than all of them. Now we join in Nambaya's version of God of the Bible, led for us from Mount Royal.
would like to invite the children and young people to stay for one more section of this story. And when we begin to sing our next musical um, a hymn, then you're free to go with Elizabeth. So things really get out of hand. And over time, Joseph's brothers, they grow so angry and jealous that they start looking for an opportunity to kill him. And then one day they see their chance. Jacob has sent Joseph out into the desert to make sure his brother's okay, because looking after thousands of animals and protecting them from predators and thieves can be dangerous. And in the distance, Joseph's brothers see him coming. So they say to each other, here comes that dreamer. Let's, let's, let's kill him and throw him into one of these dry wells. And then we'll tell people that he was eaten by a wild animal. And then we'll see about those dreams of his. The only one who doesn't want Joseph to die is Reuben, the son of Leah and the oldest of Jacob's sons. Joseph's big brother. So Reuben convinces his brothers to throw Joseph into an empty well without killing him. And then the brothers rip off that beautiful cloak that Joseph is wearing and throw him into the nearest dried up well. Then they all go to eat lunch, except for Reuben who's gone off somewhere to think. And Reuben thinks, well, maybe when things have calmed down, he can, he can rescue Joseph, Rachel's oldest son. But while the brothers are eating, they see a caravan of traders. And their tra these traders are actually their distant cousins. They're descendants of Abraham, their great-grandfather, and of Hagar's son, Ishmael. And the traders are on their way to Egypt, where they will sell their merchandise. So Judah, another one of Leah's sons, suggests to his other brothers that this is the perfect solution. They can get rid of Joseph without being the ones to actually kill him. So they sell their 17-year-old brother as a slave for 20 pieces of silver to the caravan of traders. And Reuben, he's too late coming back to save Joseph. So he, he reluctantly agrees to deceive their father Jacob because the brothers are all afraid of what Jacob would do if, they, if he ever found out how they had treated his favorite child. They take Joseph's robe and they dip it in blood and they tell their father that Joseph has been eaten by a wild animal. Joseph tears his clothes in grief and he begins to sob, declaring that only death will end his grieving. Nothing will ever be the same in the house of Jacob.
Meanwhile, meanwhile in oh. Egypt, Joseph is sold in slavery to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. He arrives in Egypt with shackles on his feet and irons on his neck, having been forced to walk 500 kilometers by that caravan of traders. But as the days go by, something makes Potiphar think. Success seems to follow this young man around his new job. Gradually, Potiphar begins to give him more responsibility and more power. Before long, Potiphar has made Joseph into the administrator for his entire estate, money, fields, business ventures, and all of the staff. We might say that Joseph has effectively become Potiphar's CEO. Potiphar is like the chairman of the board, who reports to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has well over 50% of the shares in Egypt. Now, in Egypt, it is possible for someone like Joseph to be upwardly mobile. He is fast becoming a powerful businessman. He can own property, and he can imagine purchasing his freedom one day. Potiphar's wife, known traditionally as Zuleika, notices that Joseph has youthful beauty and is irresistibly handsome. Joseph begins to experience daily sexual harassment. He tries to avoid the situation, but eventually Zuleika catches him in the house when they are alone and rips off his cloak, trying to force him into bed with her. Joseph runs away, but Suleika is so angry at being rejected and so afraid of what Joseph might say about her that she tells the whole household, all the servants, that he tried to assault her. When Potiphar hears the made-up story that evening, he is furious. He has Joseph thrown into the royal... He has Joseph thrown into the royal prison while he decides what to do. Once again, once again, Joseph's cloak has been ripped off. Once again, he is being unfa unfairly imprisoned because of someone else's jealousy. Once again, a lie is being told about him. Joseph cries to God for help. He wonders if God can still hear him. He thinks about his brothers back home. He thinks about his father, Jacob, and his little brother, Benjamin. He wonders what his mother would think if she knew that he was a slave now, like Bilhah had been her slave, like Zilpah had been enslaved to Leah, like Hagar had been enslaved to Sarah. And still, Joseph cries to God. And over to Julia to lead us in. Be thou my vision.
So, remember what happened to Joseph when he was working for Potiphar? How he became so successful? Well, the same thing happens with the warden of Pharaoh's royal prison. That prison warden makes Joseph into the de facto manager. And the prison warden already knows how good Joseph has been at his job because Joseph was his boss before those false charges brought by Zuleika. You know, prisons are different in Egypt back three or 4,000 years. So remember, Potiphar is the captain of Pharaoh's guard. The prison is Potiphar's house, his mansion. Joseph hasn't actually moved anywhere. While he's in the dungeon, Joseph is learning a lot about Pharaoh and the Egyptian political system because this is where those who displeased the royal family are sent. And one day, two prisoners are put under Joseph's responsibility. Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker have displeased him. And while these two men are waiting to learn whether they will live or die, they each have dreams. They tell Joseph about their dreams and somehow, God gives Joseph the wisdom to interpret them correctly as being prophetic dreams. And then the baker is put to death and the butler is allowed to live, just as Joseph said it would happen. So the butler promises to put in a good word to Pharaoh for Joseph, but at first, he's just so relieved to be alive that he forgets this promise. But a while later, Pharaoh has these two very strange dreams that none of his spiritual advisors can interpret. And the butler suddenly remembers his promise to Joseph. So he rushes to tell Pharaoh about who might be able to interpret these dreams. When Joseph has been shaved and cleaned up from the filth of the dungeon, he comes to see Pharaoh. God gives Joseph the insight he needs to understand that Pharaoh is being given a premonition about a terrible famine that is going to arrive in seven years and last for seven more years. Joseph's administrative instincts kick in. He presents Pharaoh with a plan to store grain now for the coming time of famine. And Pharaoh can see that Joseph has extraordinary skill and incredible wisdom. Even though Joseph has a different religion, Pharaoh believes that Joseph's wisdom must be divine. So he gives Joseph a beautiful Egyptian linen cloak 
and he gives him jewelry, a royal charity, a chariot, and all the authority of his royal office. Joseph is now 30 years old, and Pharaoh has put him in charge of all of Egypt. People have to obey Joseph as though he is Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh gives Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphonath Panea, and he gives him an Egyptian wife, Asenath, the highly educated daughter of an elite Egyptian priest. Joseph has been given another beautiful cloak. As the favorite of his father, he had been cast into the dry well and sold into slavery. Now he's the favorite of Pharaoh, raised up as the most powerful individual in the land. Let's join together in singing Voices United 600 when I needed a neighbor. Seven, seven years later, as Egypt and the surrounding lands fall into a devastating famine, Joseph, now known better as Safnath Panea, begins to sell the vast supplies of grain he has been collecting. The fate of multitudes is in his hands. It's now over 20 years since his brothers sold him to those Midianite traders. Joseph's own two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are toddlers born before the great famine. And then, and then one day at work, 
Joseph opens his eyes wide and instantly recognizes ten of the visitors who are bowing before him. Ten out of the hordes of refugees who are coming to buy food from the only place that seems to have adequate stores. They are ten of his eleven brothers. The same ten brothers who sold him into slavery. Only his little brother, Benjamin, is missing. The dreams of his youth in which his family would bow down before him and treat him like a king flash before his eyes. Joseph, or Zaphnath Hanean, as the ten men know him, speaks harshly to them with his Egyptian clothing, speaking a different language, with the voice of a 39-year-old man of authority, they have no idea who he really is. Joseph accuses them of spying and throws them in a pot of ours prison for three days. He pretends not to understand their conversations but he hears them talking about their guilt and remorse for having sold him into slavery. At Zapnath Panea, Joseph sends them home with strict orders to bring back the youngest brother they had told him about. This, he tells them, would prove that they are not spies. If they come back for more food and Benjamin is not with them, they will be killed. Joseph keeps one of his brothers as a hostage. He can't be sure whether he should trust them, but he can't bear to see his family starve in spite, in spite of having been sold into slavery by them. When Joseph's brothers arrive back in Canaan, they open their bags of grain and their hearts sink in terror. The money they have paid for the food that has been returned in the bags of grain. It feels like a trap. And Jacob is being asked to send Rachel's last son, Benjamin, to an unknown fate. First Joseph, then Simeon, the one being held hostage back in Egypt. And now Benjamin. And once they get there, they expect to be accused of theft. If they don't go, their families will eventually starve to death. So, in the end, despite all their fears and the agonizing grief that Jacob holds in his heart, they have to return with Benjamin. But they have a plan. In addition to the payment they found in the food bags, they will bring gifts, and they will bring twice as much money again in case they are asked to make restitution. This time, this time when they arrive in Egypt, Safna Panea treats them with gracious hospitality. And then, on their way home with food, Joseph makes sure that the 11 sons of Jacob discover that not only has their money been returned again, but that Zatnas Penea's special divination cup is in Benjamin's food sack. They tear their clothes in horror and grief and quickly return to the home of Zatnas Penea hoping to throw themselves at his mercy. Once there, Zapnath Panea insists that Benjamin, the apparent thief, stay behind as a slave while the others can return home. But then, Judah, the ringleader of the plot, 
to sell Joseph as a slave those many years ago approaches the royal one that he knows as Zaphonath Panea. Judah begs to remain as a slave in the place of his little brother, saying that he has promised their old father that he would be personally responsible for Benjamin. He speaks of how Jacob would die of grief if his youngest son does not come home. And Joseph begins to sob, even though he is alone in a room with his 11 brothers, he weeps so loudly that everyone in the palace hears him. He tells his brothers that when they thought they were selling him into slavery, God had actually been making a way for him to be able to save all of them from the five remaining years of this famine. And in that room, between tearful embraces, Joseph tells his brother to bring their father Jacob and his whole family back to Egypt, where he can use his wealth and power to provide for them and protect them. They will settle in Goshen, the most fertile part of Egypt. He sends them home laden with gifts, telling them not to worry. So Jacob's old heart is comforted, and he travels to Egypt with all of his sons and his daughters and their spouses and their children. All 70 members of that family come to Goshen in Egypt, and there is a long, tearful meeting between Joseph and his father Jacob, also known as Israel. Jacob lives out the rest of his long life there in Egypt and dies with a promise from Joseph that his bones will one day be taken back to the ancestral homeland. Joseph has him embalmed by his Egyptian physicians. He takes Jacob's remains and buries them with the remains of his parents and grandparents. Now that Jacob has died, Joseph's brothers become afraid again. They still worry he might want to get revenge on them for what he, they had done to him all those years ago. But Joseph reassures them, reminding them that God has used their wrong actions for good things, even wonderful things. And then Joseph continues to protect and care for all of them and their families until he dies. And here ends the story of Joseph. Jessica, thank you Kent and Jessica for, for sharing the story of Joseph with us. When it seems that your life is going sideways and you wonder how you'll cope, God makes a way where there is no way, our faith stories tell us. God is there, and our communities of faith are there to hold us together in life, in death, and beyond, to keep our doors open to all who seek Jesus we ask your generosity in time, talent, and treasure. Come, let us give as we are able as we receive this morning's offering. And, we'll, and while we're doing that, we'll enjoy Julia, Murray, and Lala with Dear Weaver of Our Lives Design, Voices United, number 623.
We'll give John a moment to bring up the offering plate, and then we'll offer the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. O oh God, take these gifts we offer and the gifts we are, that they and we may make a difference to our communities and for your world. For the abundance of your love, your grace, blessing us with riches beyond our imagining, we give you thanks. Amen. And we'll send it over to Kent for the prayers of the people. And indeed, we join our hearts together in prayer at this time. And I invite you, if you have any prayer requests, if you have access to the chat, you can put them there. Otherwise, there will be a moment of silence during the prayer where people can add their voices. For those on telephone, at star six to unmute. On this day, O oh God, we remember the story of your servant, Joseph. Help us to know, O oh God, how when life goes sideways, you are still with us. And while we may not be able to see our way forward, you are busy recreating plans and that you continue to walk with us. You are with us in the depths of the well. You are with us in the wilderness. You are with us in prison. You are with us through each day. We lift up prayers of God for the many situations upon this day where your care is especially needed. We begin by praying for the people of Maui in the wake of such devastation with loss of life, loss of homes, loss of the ways to make a living. We continue to pray as well for peace in this troubled world, remembering especially again Ukraine, Sudan. We think of the Quebec farmers with the excess of rain and British Columbia with the lack of rain. And on this weekend, we also pray on this day of the Pride Parade for acceptance and respect. We pray in the face of rising homophobia and transphobia and all the other related things. We pray for acceptance and respect. And we lift up prayers for individuals that we know, for those who grieve, for those who are not well, for those who are in hospital, for those who are struggling to find their way forward. We pray for Greta and for Francis. We pray for the family of Peter Mundy. We pray for Jay and Jean-Francois and Doug. We pray for Gary's cousin, Janet, for Jean and Leslie, for the Canadian farmers, for Claudette, for Kenny and Anne, and if there are other names to add. Father, 
all these prayers we gather together, O God. And we join together in the words of our Lord's Prayer. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. can't anymore. <laughs> May the God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and the whole family of Israel, the God who has been our shepherd to this day, 
the Holy One who redeems us from all evil. Bless these, our communities of faith, and make them grow. Amen.